I went traveling through Denmark, Hungary, and Sweden. Sweden is a common factor between both of us. But I was looking at it from the company's perspective at how the companies have managed to make waste management possible in partnership with the government. Uh, let me begin with uh, Sweden first. Sweden till 2001. If you had seen the waters around Sweden, they were brackish, it was a cesspool, and uh, uh, the, the water was terrible. There are times when a nation has an accident, and the accident came in, the, in 2004, when Sweden was not, was, there was a possibility that Sweden would be, that Stockholm would be selected as an Olympic center. Because Stockholm was to be selected as an Olympic center, the government suddenly got its act together and said, we must change, this, we must change the city. A lot of the laws which he talked about, banning landfills was the most important. It just banned landfills. Then it started taking up the most industrial areas where pollution was in the soil. The soils were contaminated with all kinds of chemicals and pollutants and toxic, toxic elements. And a systematic upgradation of the soil began and waste management systems came to be put in place. Now how that was done is partly my presentation. Much of it is pictures. I'm just going to go through the pictures so that you get a visual representation. One more thing. When I went to Sweden, I knew there were, I knew there were, there were rivers, I knew there were streams, I knew it was a water. It was rich with water resources. I came from Budapest into Stockholm, and because I took the cheapest airline, it was a turboprop, so you go at a low height, at a low altitude, and I was surprised that you had thousands of islands around Sweden, and later I came to know that 9,000 islands around Sweden. Okay. Sweden is an archipelago which is filled with islands. I don't know how they remember the names of the islands or how they navigate through them. But it is because they were surrounded by islands and because it was a water country, they had to look at water in a different way. There's a second thing that you have to remember, that Sweden, Norway, Denmark are cold countries. So incineration makes tremendous sense for them because while they burn the fuel or the waste, they capture the heat and the heat goes into warming the city. That incineration may not be the best solution for India. And I'll come to that also. You have the next problem Sweden is aware was urbanization. Globally, they know that urbanization is going to keep on increasing. You're going to have almost 60% urbanization by 2030. India is already seeing the pressures of urbanization, which is why the Prime Minister is talking of 100 smart cities. There is a logic behind that, and there is a desperate need to have planned cities, and some of the planning will come in just now. You have color-coded waste that she talked about, but I've been to the plant where the waste disposal systems take place, and I'll come to Linkoping a little later. Uh, Linkoping is a city which is unusual. It collects waste from 30 municipalities and even imports waste from, UK, from Norway and from UK because its hunger for waste is tremendous. It has the largest waste handling systems. And in Linkoping, the municipality has subcontracted the work to a company called Tec Tecniska Ferken. This is a wholly owned corporate body held by the municipality and its job is to provide electricity heating to the entire region and to generate that electricity and to generate that heating, it has to depend on waste only. Today in Sweden, 30% of its national electricity needs come through waste. Okay. Now the trouble with these color-coded bags is when they go into the, into, onto the conveyor belt, they're picked up by cranes thrown there, almost 20% of the bag, bags tear. So you get a mixture of all kinds of waste coming in. Then they have other technologies to separate even the torn bag waste and to separate them and then decide whether it should go to the garbage pit for uh, fermentation and thus gas methane generation or whether it should go to its incineration. The incineration chambers are huge mammoths, but they're designed in such a way that there's hardly any pollution, any carbon that escapes in there. That is because of heat capture techniques 
which is critical to a cold country because that heat goes into warming floors, into warming roads. Roads also need warming so that the ice does not form on them. And water. Look at this. These are the kinds of cranes you have in the, city, in the place. Of course, the place is smelly. When you go inside, you realize how smelly the place can be. Like any garbage pit will be smelly. And then they pick up these bags, put them on the, uh, on the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt automatically separates through color coding. This is, a com this is a company called OptiBag, which is a subsidiary of a company called Envac. Envac manages to move waste across. And how it does it, I'll talk, talk, talk about it in two minutes. So it takes that, puts it in the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt separates the white and the browns. Wherever the bags are torn, it has a different mechanism for separating the waste, and the waste is separated either for fermentation or for incineration. The best technologies for managing waste and to manage cities is by a project which is called Symbiocity. There they call it Symbiocity. But Symbiocity is a future of all cities, and this is uh, uh, one. Yes, the gentleman's name is Eric Freudenstall, and he is the man who collects all the technicians, all the technologists to plan the future of cities. Symbiocity is very interesting because it talks about several things. It talks about synergies between, way, between water supply and sanitation, traffic and transport. Waste is not separate. Waste is connected to all these things. Energy, urban functions, architecture of buildings so that you don't use too much of energy, waste management, and landscape planning. All these things are synergized so that waste City, water, energy go hand in hand. And look at the things it does. Land use, land use soil, uter, soil pollution, energy, water and sewage, garbage, building material, transportation, noise, green areas. Ground rules. There are design guidelines. This is the Freudenstahl, uh, sorry, this is the Fredericks, uh, Fredericksdahl, Hammerby, Siostad, that is a new city that's come up. Architectural, coordin architectural coordination, color schemes, material qualities, parks and streets, lighting, public art. The city planning department is brilliant. It decides how the building should look, what colors they should use, how many floors they should have, and that is a strength of a municipality. Hammersby's objectives are public transport, carpool, ferry, decrease car use by 40%. Because cars pollute, that is also waste. They want to bring in the best of developers and builders. Now, one interesting thing was, when it set its targets, they believed that the cost of putting these additional technologies, technologies into buildings and cities would be approximately 2% of development costs additionally. When the construction is actually done, they found that the additional incremental cost of putting those technologies in those buildings, in those roads, in the cities was 0.2. So your developer cost of building a building, if it's planned carefully, the cost goes up by maximum 2%. Their experience is 0.2. Look at this. What kind of equipment goes in to make sure that the energy saving is decided by the apex body? Low flushing toilets, where you use little water and use motors for suction. Develop, as I said, 2 to 4% was the cost. It actually came to 0.2%. Hammerby talks about water, waste, energy. Those are the three critical areas that cities need to look at. Waste movement. Now, this is perhaps the most uh, important the company which, com which commands waste movement uh, contracts almost across Europe is NVAC. Incidentally, NVAC has also been given the mandate to do the waste management system in India's first smart, smart city, which is the gift city in Ahmedabad. NVAC is also set up, has also set up a facility in one of the plushest buildings in Bombay at, uh, uh, at Satrasta, where there's a three-tower structure coming up. All the waste management systems there are in back. So what is in back? Uh, 
let me point out here. You have these three bins over here. The three bins, I, I don't want to use the pointer, I prefer to be with other points. The three bins are connected straight away with tubes which go down into a tube-like structure right at the bottom. And this goes to the final waste bin. When you put garbage into, the, into one of the bins, they're color-coded, so you put dry waste in one, you put organic waste in another, you put wet waste in the third. The bins are automatically managed. By weight and by volume, there's a trigger. If the trigger point is crossed, then suddenly a suction comes, the valve opens, and the suction pulls the garbage down. Outsiders don't know it. Every building to throw garbage in, there's a door to the garbage can, can, which is opened by a smart card, so any outsider can't put a bum into the garbage pits. So every resident has a smart card, only the smart card can open it, and which smart card has opened which bin is available to the authorities in case of investigation. Earlier it was only volume control. Then they found that some, some stupid person started putting metal waste. In one place, they found half a canoe thrown into this. Another point, they found that the bicycle, uh, the three rods had been put into the garbage bin. Now, when these rods go and collect at the bottom pipe, you have a problem because then you have to dig up the road. To prevent that, they put a weight measure. Whenever, the way, whenever a, garbage, a bit of garbage has an unusual weight, there's a weight trigger, the bottom seals, alarms go off, and the man personally comes, checks up the bin, removes the dangerous ob object so it does not clog up the underground pipes. All these garbage disposal systems, movement systems, are done by NVAC. Water consumption must be reduced. From 200 liters per day, per person per day, the plan is that it should go down to 100 liters per person per day. In the last 10 years, they've reduced it to 150. Achievement, aim was lower than half. The result is that carbon footprint has been reduced to almost 30 to 40% in the last 10 years. Lessons to learn, set up a vision for the project, cooperate with all participating parties, both with governmental as well as, as private. When you set up the targets, be specific so that they can be measurable. And most important, holistic perspective. The new city that they're developing is the Royal Seaport, again a contaminated area, and they want to change this area into one of the greenest areas. As I said, much of the work in Sweden, the planning is done in a place called Linkoping by Tekniska Verken. It is, look at the figures below. Today it takes about one million tons of garbage every year, and it produces 140 giga gigawatt hours of energy through biogas, 2,100 gigawatt hours of heat, and 600 gigawatt hours of electricity, all through waste. Products and services, these are various products and services that link up that uh, Techniska Verken offers. Uh, energy services, water, electricity, uh, contracting work. Some of them are natural monopolies, some of them they compete with the private sector. Waste to energy in Linkoping, as I said, you take the waste, you convert it to energy, much of the energy is heat capture, is capturing heat. Uh, when you capture heat, the beauty is that when you burn something, you capture heat, your efficiency is almost 80 percent. But when you try to convert the heat into electricity, your efficiency drops to about 30 percent. So you have to have different techniques for India. OK, sorry. OK, sorry. Our waste to energy, incineration, I talked about that. Waste to energy experience biogas. They are in biogas. Their strength is not in fermentation as yet but they depend on other partners to provide the fermentation experience. A lot of experimentation is still going on. But this tells you how they're replacing fossil fuels in Linkoping. Oh, sorry. I pressed the last button by mistake.
Yes. The journey is, uh, the, the aim is to have a carbon neutral city by 2025. As I said, one of the most important things is to have blended waste collection systems. This was a waterfront. And if you see there, you have one bin there. And that bin is a bin which is near the waterfront. Here, somewhere behind, you can see a small platform. That platform is also a waste collection system for boats. It's like a bench. It's made, it looks like wood, but it's actually metal. You open that, and inside, there's an outlet where the boat can pump all its sewage into. There's another outlet into which all it, put, it puts its garbage into. And the third outlet into which all other dry waste goes in. And everything is done through suction, so no garbage. And when the garbage transfers are over, the lid is put back. It becomes a bench for the public to sit on. This little pillbox is for all kinds of waste. And the segregation is done automatically after it's sucked into the central pool. I've been to parks where the park has several bins like this and all of it gets sucked into one common pit and the pit is also in the garden. It looks like a garden and if you happen to be sleeping there, suddenly after two days you'll find that the pit goes up and there's a container which the truck comes and takes the container, empties it, brings it back. This is the municipal ward where every individual come and put in his refrigerator, put in his tires. Everything is a separate compartment. You can see the neatness of the place. This is the garbage collection center. Compare that with any of our garbage collection centers. This is also the garbage collection center. The blended system, this is the tank, which is like a seat, but is actually a waste collection center. This is again a waste collection center. All these are waste collection centers. This is what I explained to you. There's another technique. One of the largest pump manufacturers in the world, not one of the largest, the largest pump manufacturer in the world, is a company called Grundfos, which is in Denmark. And it has a collaboration with uh, a place called Bilund, which is close to its headquarters. And they manage the waste to energy for the municipality. What they do is put in these pumps, they burn the waste, the pumps capture the waste. During winter time, this waste, this heat is taken and to heat the entire city, the state pays for all the heat. So the taxes that you pay for waste collection comes back to you as free heat. So you may look at it as taxes, but there's a free benefit coming to you. Education is free, medicine is free, heat transfers are free. And water is free. So these pumps of, of uh, Grundfos suck the waste from the entire municipality, burn it, use it for the city. During summer months, they take the hot water, pump it underground, and pump out the underground water, which is cooler than the overground water, and cool the entire city with that water. During winter, after the heating, that water is pumped down to warm the water below, and the difference between the, ambient, between the normal temperature and the new temperature cannot be more than four degrees. And everything is managed through these systems. So this is the way of using groundwater. And look at the costing. You save 400,000 euros every year. Thus, in 10 years' time, you pay for the entire system. The system is profitable after 10 years. So what does India do? And this is the last two slides. We believe that in India, the answer would lie beyond incineration. India has a natural advantage of 1.2 million people. In a city like Bombay, you've got 20 million people. Assuming that a solid waste for per individual is one kilo, you have almost 20,000 tons of waste. Solid waste being created by human beings. India has the largest number of cattle in the world. What you need to do is for new townships coming up, cluster development projects coming up, slum development projects coming up, is that the toilet waste needs to be aggregated into one pit. The beauty is that a gasification project becomes economically viable with the best of technologies only when there's a minimum collection of 400 tons per day. Bombay, solid waste is 20,000 tons per day. 2,000 tons per day, sorry. Okay, 
So seven to 10,000 is a huge amount. For each of these clusters, if you can set up a gasification plant, once it's more than 400 tons or tons per day, you can also put in a desulfonation project, remove the sulfur. Once you remove the sulfur, the smell goes away. Beyond 400 tons per day, the sulfur generated is large enough to pay for the cost of desulfonation. So it's, it's revenue neutral. And once the methane is taken out, once the gas is taken out, the gas can be used for cooking, the gas can be used for electricity, the gas can be used even for CNG, for driving vehicles. Once the gas has been taken out, the remaining slurry can be dried, pelletized, and sold as organic manure. In other words, waste has three sources of revenue. The first revenue is, of course, the waste, whatever waste can be sold, bottles, cans, etc., rack pickers pick up and sell it. The second part is methane, and the third part is organic manure, besides sulfur. That's a fourth additional revenue. Our belief is, and all our studies show, that in less than seven years, these gasification plants pay for themselves. Most important, you don't pay for garbage collection anymore, or garbage removal anymore. And when you have a gasification project, now let me tell you one more example. One of the largest gasifiers in India is by a man called Vinay Kore in Varna. He has the largest digester, about 22,000 cubic meters a day. When I asked him, are you going to use the gas, the methane, for electricity generation, he said, no. I said, why? He said, because when I generate electricity, I get only 5 rupees per cubic meter. But when I sell it as CNG or as LPG, I get 45 rupees. Today, at 22,000 cubic meters, he's making 22,000 into 45 every day, which is more than the money that he makes, more than the profit that he makes from milk or sugarcane. Waste is big business. Waste is profitable if you know how to handle it well. Which is why some of the most interesting projects in India are gasification projects, and maybe that is where India's future may lie. And that is where my presentation ends. We'll be glad to answer any questions.